We are very uh, fortunate. We have two really great speakers tonight, uh, both from JPL, Kayleen Carpenter and Morgan Cable. Uh, Kayleen comes from an engineering background with a master's in mechanical engineering uh, from Cal State LA and a bachelor's in industrial design from Arizona State University. Kayleen is now a research engineer at JPL, uh, focusing on developing new technologies for gripping and mobility in rough terrain. Um, and he's done a ton of cool projects, including the uh, Puffer project, I think he's co-PI, right? Um, which we had a presentation on a few months ago. Um, Gecko-like climbing robots and just a ton of other really cool things. Uh, Morgan Cable, on the other hand, comes from a science background. Um, and she graduated from, with a PhD in chemistry from Caltech. Uh, sh her research uh, focuses on um, organic and biomarker detection. Uh, she is a member of the project science team for the Cassini mission. Uh, she's worked on the uh, mission concept for the Europa lander. Uh, what else? She's, she's uh, does um, chemistry at Titan. Uh, she I, dragonfly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dragonfly. Um, <laughs> uh, what? There was like Mount Kilimanjaro research there. Like I don't know, just everything. <laughs> Um, and so together, I think they're going to give a very interesting talk uh, with two different sides of the Exobiology Extant Life Surveyor, uh, the EELS robot, um, and talk about all the exciting work there and what's going on and what they're doing. So please help me welcome our two speakers tonight. I'm really excited about this. This is one of the first times we've been able to present this concept outside of JPL. It's still fairly fresh. It's something that we came up with or initially in uh, 2015. We've been working this problem for quite a while, but I wanted to first start off and talk to you all a little bit about the evolution of an idea. And one of the places this came from, and it's something that both Morgan and I really shared, is we wanted to be astronauts. Very much. How many of you wanted to be astronauts? Right? Well, where, where did you want to go? Where are some of the destinations you wanted to go? Don't just say Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, are, are these hospitable to us? Is Mars or the Moon hospitable? No, not, not really, but we still really want to go. My, my son told me he wanted to go to a black hole, and what if you could actually survive, right? And the thing that gets me is your imagination really gets into these environments, and we want to know what it's like. We really desperately want to know, and we will get to the point where looking up at the moon, I remember as a child, I would walk along the mountains and the valleys in my mind. So I always wanted to go, and it was disappointing to not make it there yet, uh, especially with Morgan. We'll, we'll see if it happens. But this is what led me into robotics. It was spending so much time in those locations realizing there's a robot for that. You can make a robot that won't just survive there, it'll thrive. It is almost evolved to be happy in these environments. So th this is one that I've spent a lot of time thinking about seeing all of these fantastic images from Cassini with these plumes. You're like, wow, looks like that's coming from a liquid ocean. There's a lot of reasons we want to go swimming in a liquid ocean. Is anything else swimming in that ocean? Hmm, well, what's the environment like? Start looking at the physics, and you find out, well, at 100th gravity, there's not a lot of gravity. But if you take, let's see, if you take a ball, even if you had a tungsten ball, and you were to drop that down these crevasses, there's a good chance that that plume force is actually greater than gravity. So it's not going to be able to drop down. But at some length scale, right, you'll have something where the cross-sectional area is such that the rod could fall. The problem is you're going kilometers down through an icy crevasse. There's not much chance it's straight. And if this thing gets uh, cocked sideways, it's not going to be able to go anymore, and your mission's done. So we looked at things like climbing robots that stuck to a single side. We looked at all sorts of things. But we realized that a string of beads, a string of beads has this ability to bend as it goes down, but it does have that same projected area. So at some point, you can have it long enough where it's going to be able to utilize gravity and essentially fall. But what about a driven string of beads? So that was the birth of the eels concept. and. 
There's a lot more background to it, but in a nutshell, that's it. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the idea. Hello, my name is Kalen Carpenter, and I'm the principal investigator for the EELS Project. For more than 80 years, JPL has contributed to some of the most important space missions of the age, Explorer, Viking, Galileo, and Cassini. Now we have a new quest, one that begins here on our home planet and finishes 790 million miles away. It is one of the most ambitious projects to date to find extant life beyond Earth. Enceladus is the sixth largest moon of Saturn. It is much smaller than our own moon at a surface temperature of around 75 Kelvin or negative 198 degrees Celsius. Its surface is an inhospitable ice crust open to the vacuum of space. Yet, Cassini discovered something that has captured our attention. Four 125 kilometer tiger stripes running parallel near the South Pole. Cassini found over 100 jets ejecting water vapor, salts, and organic molecules into a plume sourced from what we believe to be a salty liquid water ocean below the crust. And where there's water, there might be life. Let's take a journey through our mission concept. Targeting the jet with the greatest mass ejection, a spacecraft will land near the plume exit. From this, the Exobiology Extant Life Surveyor, or EELS robot, will deploy and traverse to the edge of the vent opening. It will assess its surroundings and anchor to react to plume forces before placing its sensor head into the plume streamline. From this, we will attain a huge amount of information about the mechanisms driving the plume and the liquid below. To truly characterize the ocean, we will venture deeper. Using pressure sensing, eels will autonomously follow the plume streamline. It will push on the sidewalls of the vent conduit, where the ice, heated and pressurized by the vent flow, acts like ice here on Earth. Eels consist of many counter-rotating threads that works as self-propelling ice skates to grip and move the robot forward against the plume forces. By adopting a spiral configuration, eels adapt to the undulating terrain. It reconfigures itself based on the reacted forces measured, maintaining outward force, ensuring constant grip. The vent most likely constricts to a throat. Eels is designed to adapt to this, becoming a self-driven screw, able to power through this point of greatest force. Once through the throat, the liquid water is near. This is the predicted high tide point where boiling of the ocean or gas exhalation from the liquid is driving the plume. Once in the liquid, eel swims, using the instruments to see if it swims alone. And maybe one day, venture deeper to hydrothermal vents, possible alien nurseries of life. It'll take up to 12 years to reach Enceladus, less than a day for eels to penetrate through the ice and start to explore the dark waters. But it will only take an hour and a half to communicate the findings back to Earth. This may be one of the most momentous messages ever received from space. Thank you for watching. Let me uh, hand this over to Morgan, who will give you the science motivation that led to really working on how to get here, why this is important to all of us. So that was amazing. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah. That was incredibly hard to follow, but uh, Kaylin and I are a team, and so hopefully I can, I can make us just as excited as that incredible animation, which actually, uh, wasn't it some of the people who worked on the Avengers helped us? Uh, with that. So it's amazing when you live in LA, uh, all of the, the bridging cross-disciplinary -discipl work that you can do. We actually didn't know who it was, and we got this note at the end. Thank you for letting us you know, work on this. We know that our 
uh, work doesn't necessarily have intrinsic value. Who needs another superhero movie? And I had no idea who they were, so I took my kids to see Avengers Endgame, and their logo came up. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't pay very much for that. I guess they made a bunch of money off Avengers. <laughs> so now it's our job to make it real. And why do we want to go? Well. We have been incredibly fortunate with the Cassini mission. Uh, Cassini launched in 1997. Don't tell me how old you were. I'm sure some of you might not have been born yet. It's very depressing. Uh, but it, it, Saturn Orbit Insertion, SOI, was in 2004. And so for 13 years, Cassini explored Saturn and its moons. Now, when Cassini was first built and launched, we had no idea that the Saturn system was as dynamic and active as we now know it to be today. And so we, we cleaned Cassini, but we didn't sterilize it because we didn't think we needed to. We thought that all of these moons, Enceladus included, that are in orbit in and around Saturn, uh, some of them nested in between the rings, we thought they were just dusty ice balls, or icy dust balls, depending on who you talk to. But we thought they were frozen and boring and cold and dead. Uh, it turns out that if you look in just the right light, uh, they're not. And Enceladus is one of the moons that we now know to have a global subsurface liquid water ocean. Now, Kaylin said that Enceladus is relatively small compared to some of uh, Saturn's other moons. Uh, it's about the size of Arizona. But it turns out small things can be mighty. And uh, Enceladus certainly has continued to impress. Uh, as Cassini spent more time in the Saturn system, we were able to get a lot of these photos just right in terms of having things either front lit or back lit by Saturn shine or by the sun uh, so that we could image the plume uh, very well. Now, indeed, this plume does come from that liquid water ocean. So this is incredibly rare, right? There are plenty of other places in the solar system in orbit around Saturn and Jupiter, and potentially further out as well, that have liquid water. But it may not be as accessible as this ocean. And this is why Enceladus is near and dear to our hearts. Now, while Cassini does get credit for first discovering this plume and this global subsurface ocean um, underneath the crust of Enceladus, uh, we actually went back, we didn't, uh, some, some other colleagues did, and looked at some images that Voyager 1 took as it was screaming through the Saturn system on its way to become uh, one of the first man-made, human-made objects uh, out in the, the outer, outer space, officially outer space, no longer in the solar system. And this is an image that, that it took. This is from Voyager 1 of, this is Saturn right here, and that's Enceladus. And with modern uh, processing techniques, uh, this guy Ted Strick was able to get this image. And what, what's that? So it turns out while Cassini will go down in history as being credited as discovering the plume of Enceladus, Voyager may have actually captured the first shot. Now this is also exciting for us from a scientific standpoint, because this tells us that the plume has been active at least as long as Voyager. We believe it's been much, much longer than that, because it actually feeds the E-ring around Saturn. And it comes from these four beautiful tiger stripes that Kaylin mentioned that are at the South Pole. Now we're still not sure why they're just at the South Pole. That asymmetry is kind of weird. There are a few theories, including some giant impactor that hit Enceladus uh, in its past at some point. Uh, but we do know that there are uh, more than 100 jets coming from that area. And thanks to Cassini, we have these digital elevation models, or DEMs, that we can use to be able to picture these terrains in 3D. Now most of the features on Enceladus, since it's relatively small, aren't that large. They're on the order of maybe a few hundred meters at most. And in those areas, we can find some spots that are smooth, that are safe enough for landing. We have the imagery today to be able to help inform a future landed mission of Enceladus. Now, this is really critical when you're trying to land hardware on a surface. Now, we still don't know a lot about the surface properties. We don't know if it's fluffy from micrometeoroid impacts and from this plume constantly depositing fresh snow on the surface. We don't know if because of sintering or other sort of exposure to radiation, it might be like creme brulee and have like a crust and then sort of a soft bit. And so some of the engineering challenges that Kaylin will be talking about a little bit later involve being able to handle any kind of terrain like that. Um, because while we do know a lot, there's still a lot we don't know. But thanks to Cassini sampling this beautiful plume, we know that this is a place we want to look. We know that 
the tiger stripes are warmer because of the, the infrared instrument of Cassini, Sears, than the corresponding terrain. So it may be 75 Kelvin around most of the surface, but we do believe that uh, through these vents that go all the way to that ocean, uh, we think the ocean is, is right about 4 degrees C or maybe a little bit warmer, but it's definitely liquid. We also were able to fly through the plume multiple times with Cassini and basically stick out our tongue and taste what the gas and the grains were made of. Now Cassini was not meant to be a seafaring mission, so we didn't design instruments specifically to look for life because we didn't think liquid water existed out this far. Um, but we made the most with what we had and thanks to the ion and neutral mass spectrometer, INMS, we were able to find water, carbon dioxide, ammonia, but importantly we found methane and molecular hydrogen. Now these are really important because we found these in concentrations that's higher than if the methane had just been trapped at, like as a clathrate or some sort of trapped in a cage of water kind of in the ice. So we believe that both of these molecules are sourced from the ocean. Now Enceladus, its ocean, is in contact with the, the silicate core, the rocky interior of that moon. And we believe that the methane and the hydrogen may be coming from interactions between that rock and the liquid water. Now there are a lot of places on Earth where that happens too. And in almost all of those places, as far as I know, we also find life there. So this is very exciting. Hydrogen in particular, a colleague of mine, uh, Chris Glein, did a calculation to figure out in terms of how much hydrogen is coming out. It's the, it's the easiest bond to break, right? So it's kind of like baby food for bacteria. It's kind of the easiest food that you can eat. Um, and I think it's 300 large pizzas worth an hour of hydrogen coming out of the plume. So that's a lot of energy. It's a lot of food for something to metabolize. Uh, so in addition to finding methane and hydrogen, we also found not just simple, but some complex organic molecules. Now this mass spectrometer only goes up to 100 AMU, which is not that much. Half of the amino acids in your body are over 100 AMU. And proteins get up onto like 10,000 AMU, like ridiculous amounts. So we got just enough of a taste to get really excited and interested but uh, again, not a seafaring mission, not a life detecting mission, so we just got enough to know that there was more interesting stuff there and that we need to go back. Now, in addition to the gas, we also had a separate instrument called the Cosmic Dust Analyzer, CDA, that was able to stick out its tongue and grab some of the snowflakes at seven to 17 kilometers a second is really fast. So uh, those snowflakes vaporized upon impact, but that's okay because that's exactly what we wanted. Because when they vaporized, they ionized a lot of the molecules inside. And we were able to detect things like sodium chloride, a bunch of other salts, so we can get an idea of the salinity and the pH of this ocean. We think it's slightly basic on the order of pH 8 or 9. And we also found these large organic molecules uh, that we called high mass organic cations. Now just like that other mass spectrometer, they were interesting up to the limit of detection of that instrument. And so we think there's bigger stuff there. We just didn't bring the right instruments at the time uh, to find them. So we absolutely need to go back. Thanks to Cassini, we have this picture of what Enceladus and its interior looks like. We know that its crust is on the order of two to 10 kilometers thick. For most of our, our studies, we're baselining three as a maximum, just in case, to kind of give us um, some, some margin. At the South Pole, we believe it to be thinner. We know that the ocean is global because the crust is decoupled. Cassini was able to determine that it librates, it wobbles a little bit um, relative to the interior. And we have a lot of evidence for these hydrothermal vents that may exist down at the sea floor, uh, especially in the South Polar Train, maybe elsewhere as well. So that's where we want to target. Now, on Earth, we have hydrothermal vents at our sea floor. This is where seawater gets kind of sucked underneath, gets heated up, it picks up a bunch of minerals, and then when it spits out, back out into the cold ocean, those precipitate into these huge chimneys that you see here. These are actually robots, like sub submersibles. So this thing is like at least 100 meters tall. This is Lost City, which is on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in our Atlantic Ocean. And in these places, we find these diverse communities of life, not just bacteria. We're talking two worms, octopus, octopi, octopods, I think is the correct term, or octopuses, but I prefer octopods. I, I feel like that's, I'm just more comfortable using that word, so we're just gonna. Um, and, but the point is, it's, it's diverse communities of life, and they're surviving as far away from sunlight as you can get here on Earth, which is important, right? Because in a place like Enceladus, you're you're isolated from sunlight by this one kilometer thick or more uh, covering of ice. 
And so if you can survive off of geothermal or hydrothermal energy and have diverse communities like that, those are the types of things we want to search for. Now, when we were developing the yields concept, of course, we all needed a science traceability matrix because that's what we do at JPL. We come up with requirements for things because otherwise the engineers are like, why are we going? What do we do? And so if anyone wants to read this in detail later, you can come find me and I'll pull the slide back up. But suffice to say, when you're doing an astrobiology investigation, there are two things that are really important. The first one is that you never just want to bring one test for life. I mean, we, we had this same issue with the Viking landers, right, on Mars. They actually had three tests for life. One was positive, one was negative, and one was ambiguous. So where does that leave you? <laughs> we don't want to fall into that same trap. Uh, there's a really famous engineer named Gentry Lee at JPL who talks about shrinking the ambiguity box. That's what we want to do. We want to make our tests so absolute that if life is there, we will find it. If it's not, we'll know it's not there. And part of that means multiple independent tests for life. So you're not looking for the same organic molecules. You're not looking for one kind of thing. You're looking for multiple different things where if one of them was out of place, you'd be like, ah, oh, that's strange. That's weird. Why is, why is that one really large molecule there when energetically that would be really hard to form? Why is that there? But then you find five or, other, five or six more tests that all also say something is weird. That's much more convincing. Right? Carl Sagan said that life has to be the hypothesis of last resort. You must have eliminated all other theories and only be left with life as a possible explanation. Then you can convince the scientific community and everyone else who pays our paychecks at NASA. So, so that's the first thing. And the second thing when you're doing an astrobiology investigation is that you need to understand the context, right? These other things that aren't green on here, habitability, geology. You need to understand very well the environment that you're in so that you can tie back any of those, those weird anomalies that you see. Maybe it is a strange abiotic chemical reaction that only happens in those specific conditions, but you need to know what those conditions are to be able to justify that or not. And so that's why we've, we've done some, spent some hours thinking about exactly how we would do these astrobiology tests, what instruments we might bring, and then how we would put those measurements into context. And so now let's take a look at why we need to get to the ocean at all. Why can't we just stick out our tongue like Cassini did and collect some of these grains, but bring along our, our instrumentation that is specifically focused on life and is, you know, was not from the 90s, because that's when Cassini was built, but modern technology. Well, it's all well and good to, to go and fly through the plume. There's a lot you can learn from that. But ultimately, we need to understand the context. And right now, we have two main theories for how that ocean water is getting out into space. There are two separate models. One of them says that there's a giant chasm, maybe five meters wide, that um, goes directly to the ocean. And because Enceladus's orbit is eccentric around Saturn, it actually kind of pumps. So the, the vent kind of opens. It doesn't close completely, but it sort of moves in and out. And so that liquid kind of goes up and down. And you've got rapid boiling, obviously, where you're into the vacuum of space. And that's one model. Another model. Uh, which is developed by uh, Carl Mitchell and others at JPL, says instead it's more um, constricted, that you, you have a choke point, basically. And you may have a bulge or some kind of a chamber where, where the, the liquid is, is being pushed up by pressure. Uh, but then once you get to that choke point, that's where you have water at the triple point, and there's active boiling and, and mixing and, and all sorts of things as stuff is exsolvating out and, and shooting out into space. This is your shook up soda. Yes, basically that's what that is, because there's a lot of CO2 in here. So kids don't try this at home, not in this room, they just clean the carpets. Um, don't shake your soda in here, but when you get outside, you can test this model. But the point is, we need to design something that could handle either of these. And in both of these cases, uh, you can collect stuff at the surface, but it may or may not be representative exactly of what's in the ocean. Some things could boil away, some volatiles could be lost, some things could be trapped on the walls, and you could change concentrations of some important things. And so we want to get to the ocean so we can get to that pristine sample that hasn't undergone any of those changes. Now, another thing to note is, OK, well, what if you just got down like a little <coughs> bit into the chasm? And then you could take a sample there and then go a little bit down further and take a sample there. You could do that. But in both of these cases, the walls are being coated by fresh material. So they're kind of resurfacing every time there is, <coughs> there, there's, there's some sort of plume action, some plume activity. And so, you can't do like a typical depth profile like you'd want to at a place like Europa. And that's why we say it doesn't matter if you stick your toe in, you need to go all the way down. So if you go down a meter or 
five meters or 10 meters, it's gonna be the same. You're gonna get the same result. You need to get all the way to the ocean. And that's what we wanna do. So there are a lot of different things we need to consider uh, in terms of what forces we'll be going against. As Kaylin mentioned, the gravity is about 0.01 G. So if you weighed 100 or 150 pounds here, you'd weigh one or 1.5 pounds on the surface of Enceladus. Not a lot of force due to gravity, so we'll need to counteract some of the forces of the plume, as Kaylin showed in that video. Uh, the ice thickness could be anywhere from two to 30 kilometers, but we're, we're baselining three for exactly where we wanna get through, where it's thinnest at the South Pole. Uh, we have some ideas of how the plume flux changes over Enceladus's orbit and things like that that can help us inform um, where exactly we wanna go. We wanna hit the place at max flux, uh, just to make sure that that opening is gonna be big enough for us to get through and that we can guarantee that we'll get enough sample uh, even as we're going down. <coughs> and so we know Enceladus is one of the most astrobio astrobiologically compelling places to look for life. And we have the technology now to go and do this. Uh, we have a couple of things to work out, but I think we're pretty much there, or we will be soon. And Kaylin's gonna say a little bit more about some of those engineering challenges. So I'm actually just a huge fan of the science. It was learning about the science that made me interested in Enceladus. Um, that and imagining these geysers, these plumes just shooting out into space with the backdrop of Saturn seems way more alien and just breathtaking than going back to the Southwest again. But I do love Mars, I work Mars also. Uh, so some of the things to keep in mind of EELS is EELS is all driven by this adaptability. So to be able to adapt to this very wide open crevasse, basically the length of it is when gravity um, no longer dominates. So when gravity dominates, we can fall. And if you can fall, that's amazing. We're going to get down to that liquid ocean in no time at all. If gravity's dominating, um, if gravity is not dominating, we need to be able to hold on to something. One of the nice things about this is if you, as a child, I bet most of us at some point put our hands on both walls of, of our um, hallway and realize we could shimmy up to the top of it. And it could have been glossy paint. And we don't really have gecko adhesive or any adhesive technologies, but chimney problems get most of this stuff out of the way. Well, okay, it's great to be adaptable, but why bother going if you don't have the instruments to be able to do something really useful? So one of the cool things we put in here is this is actually a digital holographic microscope. This can see submicron motility. So if there is a single cell organism, even if it's submicron, as long as it's moving, we can see it. Um, but that's a fantastic uh, instrument. We're looking at a whole lot of instruments. Right now we have about 12 of these. This is going to be something that when we do the um, uh, augmented reality, right now it's two and a half meters tall, so it would come right up over my head. Um, here we have the pressure sensors, we have the sipper, we have the concentrators, and as we go through, I'll show you how it works. So one of the things that we weren't sure about is vision inside of these. If we actually have ice or snow, if we have particles coming out, um, our LIDAR is not going to work, our stereo vision, our thermal is not going to work. But if we can follow this streamline, if we know that all of this vapor is coming from a liquid ocean, we have a roadmap built in. So we had a, an intern put together a quick demo showing that this isn't a miracle. Being able to follow flow is something that we can do pretty easily with uh, pitot tubes or with pressure sensors. This is just pressure sensors. Um, does turn out there's a six axis pressure sensor. The other nice thing about this is you can have the same thing many, many times. So this is one that we also put together with some motors that were just sitting around. It's put together in about a week just to show the idea. But the nice thing about having the same thing n times is it's scalable when we want to do earth science. It also has a whole bunch of different configurations it can get itself into. So you have your slithering, you have the one where it's self-driven screw. We can actually get into a rover configuration. It can stand up and then fall over a crevasse or be able to get up a cliff. Um, a nice thing is, so this is that we would do the screws, but here it is going through our version of a converging, diverging kind of nozzle area. Um, but 
we were able to prove that we can do the force control onto the sidewalls in about a week. So if you can do that pressure sensing and you can do this force control and you can put this into your control loop, we're already a good portion of the way there of making a robot that can do this without humans in the loop. Now one of the ways that how are you going to generate enough force to be able to grip onto the sidewalls? What if you need to push hard enough to get pressure melting? What if you really need to react very large forces? Well, we wanted a gearbox that was hollow in a small area because we can only be about eight centimeters wide if we want to fit through some of the smaller, um, the smaller model's throats. Uh, so the throat is where your converging, diverging nozzle happens. We're below your subsonic and above your supersonic. And we know that everything's coming out supersonic. So it's either coming just because it turns into vapor directly out into space. So that was your open one. But in the um, model where you have the boiling, the cryovulcanism, you're going to have a more traditional supersonic wind tunnel. So we need to get a lot of force. This was actually designed here at Caltech. This is a single output that goes in your counter rotating direction as a 40 to 1 gearbox over a single stage using a hollow motor. And this was the hollow motor we could get very quickly. We'll probably actually do one that's an outrigger and we'll have even more space through the middle. It's also the same one n times. The nice thing about that is if we lose some of the actuators, the other ones can make up for it. So we can lose as many as two um, next to each other and the robot's still going to work. Excellent. So, autonomy. So, I told you a little bit about some of the challenges, but let's put it compared to our state of the art. We have M2020, which is going to go quite a bit further than uh, MSL did, but it's going to go 15 kilometers in 1.25 years, right? We're talking about going three kilometers in 16 hours. Now, why do we want to do this? We want to do this because some of the models show that these uh, crevasses are opening and closing. If they're closing, we want to make sure we're not going to get crushed. So we want to make sure we get down in basically one tidal cycle, where a year on Enceladus is 32 hours. So we need to actually get down in half an Enceladus year, which is 16 hours. So we need to move at a very good clip. There's a couple things working in our favor. If it's uh, further down and it's wider, it's going to be an open crevasse. We can probably fall for part of the way. If it is the one where it's cryovulcanism, there's a better chance that, that converging, diverging nozzle is actually closer up to the surface. Because when things constrict down to 8 centimeters and you have your 65 uh, Kelvin ice further out, you're going to be pulling a lot of heat out of everything. So if that's very low down, you're going to pull energy out of the system and it's not going to be able to be stable. So we have done stuff like this here on Earth. This is going down Old Faithful. So you can go down geysers here on Earth. So one of the issues, though, is you're not on a mast on the top of an SUV that can see for potentially kilometers. You can, if you're lucky, see one to two meters. You may not be able to see very far. This is why we're very interested in um, being able to feel our way down. So then we have a uh, couple things that are different. In the past, all the autonomy that NASA's done has been very deliberative. We're going to stop, we're going to think, maybe we're going to wait for a person to tell us what to do. Because of the uh, time of flight for light, we have that hour and a half um, single way, so as much as three hours round trip. So having people in the loop doesn't make sense, especially you're going to be in potentially hurricane uh, speed it won't be force, but hurricane speed uh, winds. So things are changing too dynamically, too quickly. So you need to be able to react to your situation very quickly. Um, in the past, we make sure everything's very, very robust. And you always want to be as robust as you can. In this case, we care more about being adaptive. So what happens if we slip? OK, we slipped. Well, can we catch ourselves? So in our case, instead of being like, we will never go somewhere where we slip, we're going to go places where there's a good chance we'll slip, but we can catch ourselves very quickly. Um, most things will be very, very protective. We need to be very, very resilient. What if there is times when we need to essentially skydive down what they call the floating pencil before we need to push out onto the sidewalls? 
What if we get through that converging diverging nozzle and um, you still have all of the air moving at a good, or all of the water vapor moving at a good clip, but because you've opened into that bulge chamber, we can't reach the sides. Well, we're gonna be buffeted and we'll probably be falling and there'll be some very interesting movements we need to do. So all of these are actually things that a lot of people here on earth are tackling and these are some of them. So the first thing we wanna do is this flow guided navigation. So we have these obstacles, but one of the nice things about the obstacles is the flow lines, the streamlines, are going to be um, accelerated in the middle. So if we're following that streamline, we know that it should be keeping us away from any of the obstacles. Also, here's this uh, proprioception. Some of our colleagues, actually a lot of the early, um, a lot of the early snake robotics was done here at Caltech. So it's really exciting for us to work with Caltech, and now a lot of it's also being done at Carnegie Mellon. So you can see this robot is just told to go forward on a heading, and it can tell if it's moving forward on that heading or not, and it just goes through these sinusoidal movements, but it can tell when it comes in contact with things and is able to push itself forward. So some of this is more things we're interested in for the surface. Oh, there's the other one where it went through the maze. So there's a lot of really cool ways people have been doing some of this controls and proprioception, but we haven't written out the ability to do a vision system. And you can see how you can suppress out the rain. So if we do have all these particles coming at us that give us a specular point cloud, so we can't build up a model very well that's gonna be reliable for us to be able to move through, there's a good chance we might be able to suppress a lot of this information or use more cameras on the outside and not look through the streamline. So we wanted to show people how this would make decisions. So the cool thing about this is this is actually the same interface that is being used currently for operating the rovers on Mars. So we decided to put in here. So this is a kind of makeup of what um, what, what you would see. So this is the force profile. So you can see the force sensors here, the pressure sensors. They're able to determine, it does this little shimmy every now and again to determine where the streamline is and then the magnitude of it so it knows how hard to push on the sidewalls. See the vision, you can also see these are a bunch of the different forms that it can get into. So these are the different modalities that we can actually enter into. And then in the future, this will actually show the forces on each one of them and potentially the speeds as well. So there's a lot of information, but we wanted to show people that the decision-making process, the autonomy to do this, isn't, isn't the miracle most people tell us it is. So it's the hardest thing that we're trying to do is have this all done autonomously. But um, we would like to prove it is not a miracle. There are a couple things I want to take you through real fast. So this is actually series gravity. So this is talking about some of those things that you might run into. So when you are in 100th gravity or um, three times that, you're gonna find that everything fluidizes as you move through it. So if we have this snow that's basically um, frozen, it's not really snow, but this plume ejecta that is frozen ballistically into little balls, and it's fallen back down to a bunch of little ball bearings that are cryo temperature, that's extremely difficult to move through. So you, why, why are we using screws and not that more circular movement with little heated uh, grippers? That's something we looked at. The reason why is because we can drop down into this media. As it fluidizes, we can still propel ourselves forward. And some of our collaborators at ASU are looking at actually burrowing. So it's not something we want to have to do. We want to land near enough to the uh, plume entrance where the temperature means it's centered and also um, the plume um, forces as everything expands has actually blown all of this away. So we're hoping to never have to do that, but we do have an architecture which if we do have to land a kilometer away um, could actually make the surface traverse. Now you saw that heated gripper come out of the back end of the uh, EELS robot. So part of this actually came from some of the early work that I was doing with sublimation gripping. So when you're in the vacuum, everything's gonna go directly to a vapor, right? So you're looking at it go directly to a vapor and we're able to anchor and react the forces without a lot of weight on bit. A drill in 100th gravity is gonna be very hard to react on the forces. Now, over here, this is really interesting. I might have to go back again and show this one a second time. Um, so. 
Anyway, that was for a sampling test. Let's check this out. So check this out. This isn't a vacuum, and this is just a heated tip. We've got some much more interesting ones now uh, with foamed metal that actually, thank you, with foamed metal that actually work like if you wanted to lick a light post um, in winter and some other anchoring techniques. But do you see this? This is real time. Do you see the sheaf forming? This right here is the reason why we think it's going to be that smaller case. Now there's a good chance it's an open crevasse. That's awesome. It's easier to get to. But if you're subsonic and if you're not supersonic before things get constricted, so anywhere you're going to have kind of an eddy in the plume flow, uh, you have water vapor. That water vapor, very much like volcanism here on Earth, is going to freeze. And volcanoes, you end up seeing these structures build up and they circularize over time. So there's a lot of information that we can still get out of what Cassini's given us. We, we are far from done with understanding the environment with what we have. So now that that thing lifted. All right, and there's one other really interesting thing that Cassini data gave us. So. By using that thermal imager, it was able to see very well uh, where the thinner areas and the greater mass flux is. Well, here's your iPhone, right? So this is our visual camera. You can't really see anything. But at night, when it's dark, even if we were on the South Pole and Saturn's occluding uh, the surface, but we only have reflected light from the sun uh, off of Saturn, we can do things that makes it so we can still actually see where we're landing. This changes how we're able to communicate back to Earth. If we need an orbiter, we're working out a bunch of interesting things like that. But we think very strongly that we'll be able to see the warm areas with the greatest mass flux. That greatest mass flux gives us something to target, and we should be able to do pinpoint landing at 100th um, Earth gravity within meters to tens of meters, I've been told. I still like preparing for that one kilometer. But it's really nice to know that the problem may be simplified by some of these other technologies. So this was just kind of for fun. We wanted to see how well it worked. Uh, the issue is this was a very hot day. You can see our ice is melting. But we did use the, uh, the thermal imagers to see if we could do the visual odometry over it. Uh, it's not, not a great result. I wouldn't trust that. But it is showing the directions we're going as we start calibrating the system and start understanding exactly how it's working. So what we're working on right now, we just finished up this accelerator phase where we spent about four months putting a lot of what you just saw together. And our goal is in a nine-month period and then hopefully three to five years after that, create a whole bunch of these and send them out to Greenland and Antarctica. Some of the things we want to do is we want to follow um, these rivers which are going over the surface of the ice and then they just plunge down into these crevasses, into these fissures. Sometimes it never comes back out. We don't know where it goes, but this seems like a great place for robots to go. This is actually a harder challenge than the Enceladus one, but we can start getting science results here on Earth as we start proving the autonomy uh, the other nice thing is because of that heating and pressurizing by the vents, the ice is actually a good place for us to prove the mobility of the system, also the autonomy, but we actually aren't interested in going down here on Earth. We're interested in going up, because going up against gravity turns out to be about the same order of magnitude forces, and if we need it to be more, we can always hang weights off the robot. And all of this work that we want to do, of course, is looking towards the 2023 Decadal Survey, where getting to an alien ocean is looking to be ranked extremely highly. This looks to be the easiest ocean other than Earth's in our solar system to get to, unless you count the, uh, the supercritical ones on, on the ice giants, which would be fantastic too, but we wouldn't find life like we know it. And start looking to see if we can't be part of a future, as, as uh, Mike Watkins calls it, civilization class mission to Enceladus. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>